Okay, imagine there's a huge hot ball hidden inside the Earth. It's floating in an ocean of molten metal. This ball also spins on its axis, but it moves faster than the rest of our planet. This is what the Earth's core looks like. The solid metal ball is the inner core, and it's 750 miles thick. That's roughly the distance between New York and Chicago, and the whole thing is made up of hot iron and nickel. The outer core is the molten ocean. To reach the edge of it, you'd need to dig a tunnel into the Earth that was about 3,700 miles long. But you would hardly want to go there because it's the hottest point on the planet. The core temperature is 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's greater than the surface temperature of the Sun. Another incredible thing about this place, the gravity at the outer core is three times stronger than that at the Earth's surface. This means that if we could somehow find a way to live near the core and you threw a stone there, it would fall three times faster than normal. It would become three times heavier. You would also become three times heavier. Now that doesn't bother you so much because things far worse will soon happen. Living conditions in the core would be the exact opposite of life on the International Space Station, and it'd be a lot harder than living on the surface. It would be difficult for you to even hold a fork in your hand because of just how heavy it would feel. Eating lunch would become a serious challenge. You'd break into a sweat just from writing with a pen on paper or typing on a computer. But if people could ever get used to these conditions, they'd become a lot stronger. Humans have learned to use the heat coming from inside the Earth as a source of energy. Some companies use this energy to heat water, which creates steam. This steam is used to power turbines that produce electricity. If the core ever cooled down and that heat disappeared, this kind of electricity might become very expensive. Some parts of Earth might become very dark, as people went back to using candles and fires to light things up at night. And you could forget about using your electric car as well, because charging it up would be just too much money. Phones, computers, the internet, all these things would cost a lot more. But this would actually be the least of our worries. Oh, just wait for it. The hot core's rotation creates the Earth's magnetic field. This field is like a shield that protects us from the sun and outer space. If the shield disappears, solar and cosmic radiation would pass through the atmosphere. The electricity supply would become seriously unstable. Microwaves, televisions, kettles, traffic lights, and computers could all be damaged. The screen of your laptop or phone would turn on and off randomly. Videos could freeze, and the batteries could run out in a second. Satellites would stop working, which means there wouldn't be any GPS system to rely on anymore. Say goodbye to navigating with your phone's map. Radio equipment would also stop working, so you wouldn't be able to make calls or send messages. Even now, when our magnetic field is working normally, solar flares can still create magnetic storms that disrupt electronics and affect people's health. Some people are sensitive to these storms and can get really bad headaches. If the magnetic field disappeared completely, every person on the planet, along with plenty of animals, would get seriously painful migraines. Scientists would have to invent special helmets that protect people from exposure to the magnetic storms. If the core cooled down and you became lost in a forest, it would be really difficult for you to find your way home even with simple equipment. Without the magnetic field created by the active core, your compass needle would no longer show where north, south, east, and west were. You would see the birds in the sky going crazy. They wouldn't know what direction to fly in for the winter, because south would no longer exist. In fact, no animal would be able to migrate anymore. In the sky, the location devices on planes would stop working. That means no more air travel until people find a new way to navigate. But hey, let's look on the bright side, because that's what we do here. You wouldn't have to go to the North Pole to see the northern lights anymore. Auroras would appear in the night sky everywhere. These occur because charged solar particles run into the magnetic lines stretching from north to south. But these lines will disappear if the Earth's core cools down, and the particles will light up the sky all over the world. A frozen core also means the tectonic plates will stop moving. There will be no more earthquakes anywhere in the world. But that's not as good as it sounds. The movement of these plates creates faults on the Earth's surface. They give us access to important minerals. With no more movement, producing fuel could become a lot harder. The price of gas might go up. 
most people would have to stop driving their cars. There would be a lot more bikes and horses on the road, maybe some llamas. Volcanoes would also stop erupting. If the core cools, the magma cools. People who live near large active volcanoes would no longer need to worry so much. But there would be a downside to this. Volcanoes contain a huge amount of useful substances and minerals. The soil around volcanoes is very fertile, which is really good for agriculture. So more people would now have to eat artificially created food. There would be big problems with the supply of natural food products. Only rich people might be able to afford that classic tomato and cucumber sandwich. But the worst thing would be the long-term exposure to radiation, which is seriously bad for our health. More radiation means that the risk of getting diseases would be much higher. People would have to build special shielding to protect themselves from solar radiation. It would be way too expensive to cover the whole planet with this technology. So we just create separate shields for each city. Just imagine the side of every city covered by a huge protective dome. In this radioactive world, Movement between cities would only be possible in special clothed transport. People would need to wear protective suits. You wouldn't be able to go to the countryside anymore. Anyone still living in a village or small town without much funding would be forced to live underground to protect themselves. Plants and animals would also have problems. Herbs, flowers, and trees would receive huge doses of radiation and wouldn't be able to bloom. Livestock wouldn't be able to eat grass and hay. Milk, cheese, and yogurt would be in real short supply. Plants would have trouble producing oxygen. The magnetic field not only protects us, it protects our atmosphere. A frozen core and no magnetic shield means that the solar wind would destroy the atmosphere in a few hundred years. The conditions on Earth would be changed completely. Humanity would no longer venture outside its protective domes with their artificial atmosphere. Instead, We'd have not only our cities, but also the last surviving pieces of nature, our trees, lakes, grass, meadows, and flowers. Everything left outside the domes would turn into a scorched desert. This is what happened to Mars. The red planet has no seas, oceans, and lakes. Some scientists believe it's completely dry because its magnetic field disappeared. With no protection, Mars lost most of its atmosphere, and the sun's wind swept away all the surface water. But of course, this is just one of many theories. This took place billions of years ago, and no one can say exactly what happened. But don't worry, our planet won't turn into Mars anytime soon. The Earth's core is cooling very slowly. It will take another 2 billion years or so before it cools down completely. What's weird, though, is that our magnetic field can be unstable even today. In the southern hemisphere, there's a spot where the magnetic field is weak. This place is called the South Atlantic Anomaly. Charged solar particles flow through this spot, which can cause problems for orbiting satellites as they pass through. There are some other places like this around the world, but fortunately, they don't cause us any really big problems. Good thing. It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoarfrost appears on the ground, the grass, and the trees, and ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky, and their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky. And the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the Sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the Sun. 
If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the Sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the Sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the Sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the Sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else, since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they'd both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 
Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. Despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the Sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the Sun, and even the presence of the Moon in its skies, all of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the Sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay? You may think the Earth is pretty big, but the Sun makes up almost 99.9% .9 of the mass of the whole solar system. The rest of the mass is made up by the planets and their satellites, asteroids, comets, gas, and dust. It's around 93 million miles away from our planet, but it keeps us warm every day. Its temperature is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the space surrounding it is still cold as ice. To understand this, we need to distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat is the energy inside some object. Temperature is something that tells us if that object is hot or cold. When the heat is transferred to that object, it makes its temperature go up. When the object is losing heat, the temperature goes down. Heat can be transferred in three different ways. The sun does it through radiation. That means it's releasing heat in the form of light. Your body radiates heat too, as infrared waves. That's why thermal imaging cameras will detect that you're in the room even at night. The hotter the object, the more heat it will radiate. The temperature only affects matter. Since space is mostly a vacuum, it doesn't have enough particles for heat to transfer in any other way than through radiation. When the heat from the sun gets to an object, the atoms start absorbing energy, but the heat can't transfer since there is no matter in space. Those rare atoms and molecules in space will absorb the heat, and they'll simply stay that way while the cold vacuum will stay cold. There's a lot of matter inside Earth's atmosphere, so the energy of the sun can transfer easily. But if you put an object outside of the Earth's atmosphere in direct sunlight, it would end up heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because it's matter made of atoms and molecules. The temperature of the vacuum is negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. That means, depending on where you are, space can either burn or freeze you. The sun isn't actually yellow. It emits light over a wide range of wavelengths. We can tell both its temperature and color by the peak in its spectrum. For instance, cooler stars will appear red, and hotter stars will be blue with yellow, orange, and white stars in between. When it comes to the sun, the spectrum peaks at a wavelength we'd usually call green but our eye perceives it differently. So, the shade of green in combination with other wavelengths from the spectrum is going to look white to the human eye. We generally see the sun as yellow because our atmosphere scatters blue light more efficiently than the red one. 
During sunrise and sunset, there's more red light in the spectrum of the sun, which gives us amazing sceneries. Sunspots are part of the sun's visible surface that are on average way cooler than the sun itself. They overlap with parts that have an increased magnetic field. These parts don't allow the release of heat to the sun's visible surface. That way, the rest of the sun's surface is three times brighter than those sunspots. That contrast makes them appear almost black. If we could take a sunspot apart from the sun and place it somewhere in the night sky, it would be different, as bright as the moon when we see it from the Earth. All the planets in our solar system spin in the same direction because they were formed from one protoplanetary cloud, except for Uranus and Venus. They have probably had some strong impact on them that made them spin in the opposite direction. But it's different with galaxies. They don't usually form the same cloud of dust and particles. Also, they're not randomly distributed across space. They come in filaments, dense, slender strands of dark matter and galaxies, with voids in between. Proto-galaxies are linked by gravitational forces in small areas of space. This is probably because of the distribution of dark matter throughout the universe. The matter in the filaments moves in a corkscrew motion and goes towards the densest area. So, there might be a common direction galaxies tend to spin, but it's mostly random. There's a possibility we'll see a lunar elevator one day. Yep, a cable anchored to the surface of the moon. It would stretch 250,000 miles. We wouldn't be able to directly attach it to our planet because both Earth and the Moon are moving. But we could keep it terminated high in our planet's orbit. Some researchers believe we could build such an elevator for a few billion dollars. The Moon has resources we could definitely use. A rare form of helium found there could be of use in fusion power stations on our planet. Also, we could take some other rare elements and use them in smartphones and the rest of electronics. So, after around 53 trips up and down, the elevator could pay for itself. The cable would be as thick as a pencil, but its weight would be around 40 tons. It could even be made of materials we already have here on Earth with no need to invent something. There could even be a combination of two elevators. A spacecraft would winch up an elevator from the surface of our planet to a space station. Then it would be flung towards the moon. There would be another elevator to finally lower it down to the surface of the moon. Planets in our solar system have predictable and stable orbits. But gas giant collisions could have happened at an early stage when a planetary system was still forming. In case of a head-on collision, two gas giants would merge they wouldn't end up losing their mass, the materials in their gaseous envelopes, or the ones in their solid cores. Such a collision at a higher speed would cause the loss of the major part of the envelope gas, and very high speeds, boom, both planets are gone. It's different if it's not a head-on collision. If two cores manage to completely avoid each other, gas giants won't merge, but they'll lose some of the mass gas giants might even change their shape due to such collisions. Astronomers found out there's a galaxy extremely far away from us that looks similar to our Milky Way. We now see it as it was when the universe was only 1.4 billion years old, and now it's 13.8 billion years old. It took over 12 billion years for the light to come from this faraway galaxy and reach our planet. This galaxy is peaceful, stable, and surprisingly non-chaotic, unlike all other galaxies that were quite turbulent in their early stages. To leave the Milky Way, we'd have to travel around 25,000 light-years away from the center of the galaxy, or 500 light-years vertically. Our galaxy is a disk of stars that spreads around 100,000 light-years across and is 1,000 light-years thick. The Sun, its central star, is located halfway from the center of the galaxy and close to the middle of the disk in the vertical direction. We'd have to go further than its edge to get away from the halo that surrounds the Milky Way, old stars, diffuse gas, and globular clusters. If you wanted to go even further to see the Milky Way in all its glory, you'd have to travel 48,000 light years vertically. At this moment, we don't even have a telescope we can send there. 
There are central stars that eat planets. Our solar system is stable, unlike many other planetary systems. So we don't have to be afraid the Earth or some other planet will change its orbit and go towards the Sun. But at least a quarter of other planetary systems with orbiting stars similar to the Sun have a pretty chaotic past. In some of them, there are planets that used to move around, and their unpredictable migrations have disrupted the paths of some other planets or even pushed them outside of their orbit. That means some planets probably have fallen into the central star. When that happens, the planet gets dissolved in the outer layer of the star, which means it gets eaten.